Are you ready? We've got two very challenging chapters in the book of Matthew that we need to deal with. And we started last week, but we are in Matthew chapter 23. And we're going to start at verse 13, where the chapter begins to really lay into the Pharisees. And as we discussed before, we would have looked upon the Pharisees as the good guys. Now, from our perspective, 2,000 years later, and when I say we, the tribe in which I was raised that considered itself restorationist, that we were restoring the New Testament church in exactly its doctrine, its faith, and its practice. The Pharisees were restorationist. They wanted to restore the Jewish law and to exactly follow it, and they felt a great obligation to do that. But they did it wrong. They got off track, as restorationism often does not to blanket condemn the whole concept by any stretch, but you can start majoring in minors, as some people have said, and all of a sudden you're not where you're supposed to be. And so Jesus is frustrated with them and he condemns them here. This is some of the harshest language that you will hear from Jesus. And then when we get through with this chapter, we're going to get into chapter 24, which has caused a lot of confusion and religious division over the centuries. So can't we just can't wait to tackle that here on a Wednesday, can we? Oh, I'm so glad that you're with us. And thank you for all of you who subscribe, who like, who hit that bell and who share this. Um, when this is being recorded, which is in mid-September, we're up to about 4,650 subscribers. I'd love to hit 5,000 by the end of the year. That's a big ask though. So um, if you're able to help us do that, that'd be great. And if you're able to help us with any end of the year giving, that would be fantastic because we could certainly use it. That said, commercial's done, right? But here we go. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 13. We've already, he's already talked about the Pharisees want to be uh, looked upon as high and important and sit in the seat of Moses and be looked upon as the scholars and the knowledgeable ones. Then he goes, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. We talked about what that word means last time, so go back and look. You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. Whoa! Every Pharisee listening to this would have been shocked and throwing their hands in the air and probably shouting, No! because they felt like by restoring the law and its exact exactitude, that they were opening the kingdom of heaven to people, but they weren't. They truly thought they were. And in many ways, the Pharisees did a fantastic amount of good, but it was the wrong, it was, it was the wrong they did and some of their assumptions and where it took them that sabotaged everything. Uh, and we've, you know, I think there are lessons to be learned for all of us. You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Now, not, I don't want to give away the plot of the book. Well, I kind of do. Two chapters from now, we're going to have a look at the judgment scene of uh, the last day. And it looks entirely different than anything that we had ever really thought of in, in churches that I've been to. In fact, I've never heard church's official doctrine look anything like Matthew 25 when they talk about the last day and judgment. Well, there are a few points that there might be some similarities, but most churches add a bunch of other stuff into the judgment day that Jesus does not. His description of the kingdom of heaven is that it's full of people that clothe naked people, feed hungry people, visit prisoners and take care of them, in other words, people who love God and love their neighbor as themselves, that's the kingdom of God. And he's saying here, you're not in the kingdom of God and you're keeping other people out. Now understand something. The kingdom of God does not mean heaven. Kingdom of God's right now. We're in the kingdom of God and we're supposed to be behaving like the kingdom of God, which means in our charity and our sacrificial giving, our benevolence, our kindness, uh, the way that we treat people, the way we share whatever we have. We will not, as the prophet warned people back then, have rust as a witness against us. We're not going to have so much stuff that it just rust. We're going to use what we have for Christ and for the needy. 
that's the kingdom of heaven. And he was saying to them, you're not in it. You think you're in it because you're following external rules and perhaps even some internal rules, but you're not in it and you're blocking others from there. It, it's, it's shocking. And he goes, he goes further. Uh, Woe to you, teachers of the law, Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when he becomes one, you will make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, Jesus, that doesn't sound very Christ-like of you. Well, there's the thing. We, we make a cartoon of Jesus, don't we? Where he has to be very nice, always smiling, holding a lamb all the time. No. Jesus would not be of much use to us if that's all he was. Now, that sounds rather shocking. I'm aware of that. There was a biography of the Apostle Paul written once that the title was Paul, Man of Steel and Velvet. And I thought that that was a good phrase. Um, Dan Fogelberg, in talking about his father uh, and his father's discipline, referred to it as a thundering velvet hand. The value of a man and a woman also, but men in most societies and most ages, it's a bit more true of them. The value of them is their love, their protection, their work, their honor, and their ability to protect even at the, um, the level of violence when needed. I'm not a pacifist. I also abhor violence. I hate violence in every form. And yet there are times where the man has to have the ability to step between his family, and the danger. Uh, danger, most likely, is not going to come from a person with a gun or a machete, not if you're living in most Western societies and most other societies, to be honest. But you know, if there's a bear outside and you know, there's nobody else to deal with it, it's not my wife's job. We all understand that when a noise occurs at night, it's the guy's job to go check. Well, this is... Um, with Christ, if he was just timid and never challenged the dangers of the leaven of the Pharisees, as he refers to it when he talks to his apostles, that little, um, that little set of attitudes and presuppositions and the like that get deeply into the doctrine, and then all of a sudden, it's, it's not the same old cake anymore. There's something very different here. So he has to come right at them. And he goes, you travel everywhere and you work hard to get another convert, but you just turn them into twice the child of hell that you are. I'm sorry, but churches do that too. I was part of a church, part of a tribe, um, a denomination that just absolutely attacked, for example, let's say the Roman Catholics or the Episcopalian priest or the like that, that have special clothing for the clergy. No, that was ridiculed. And they'd talk about the collar and the robes. And some of the things were very, very unkind that were said as a way of saying, we judge that. And yet, whenever they would go to Africa, let's say, a very hot place, you could always tell whenever the minister there had been converted by a Westerner because they'd be wearing a sport coat. Sometimes a sport coat had big rips in it and holes in it, but they were wearing it. And I remember asking one of these preachers once, just flat out, I said, is he wearing that because he wants to wear that and that's what he wears? Or is he wearing that as a badge of office? And they got very quiet and they said, well, I guess it's a badge of office. And I went, yes, it is. And sometimes I would look out over the congregation Again, in Africa, I don't have much experience in Asia. And I'm sorry if it sounds like I'm picking on Africa. I love Africa. And after you watch this, within just a few months, I'll be over there. Uh, and I just adore them. But you would see the audience and you'd see a bunch of guys with white shirts that they didn't normally wear. And they didn't have them for, for special occasion wear. Those were brought in by the brothers and sisters in America to make sure that the people had appropriate clothes for church. And it's just, what have we done? One of the, and if there are little kids in a room, uh, let's move them out for about a minute, all right? 
one of the classic studies of missology or study of missions was of a, of a whole different denomination. I didn't have anything to do with this one that went over and uh, they were warmly received by a tribe in Africa. And the women uh, showed up quite a bit as well as the men, but the women wore no tops at all. Nothing at all up here. And of course, this scandalized the, the American missionaries somewhat, but they, uh, they, uh, they had a plan. And so they wrote home, they said, we need blouses for the women. And so they got blouses for the women, they gave them to the women. The women were very, very appreciative. And next Sunday they came and the women were wearing their blouses with two holes cut out in the places you would expect them to be cut out. Why? Well, the missionaries hadn't done their job. And in that tribe, people who covered up the top were sex workers and people who were married and weren't sex workers didn't cover up their top. I know that sounds very bizarre and perhaps stand on the ish for most of us in the West, but there's the thing. They didn't do their homework. They imported their culture along with their Christianity, and it became so mixed up. There's no, well, there's no way to really for the natives to know what part comes from Jesus and what part comes from Kansas. You see the problem? All right, little kids can come back in. Woe to you, blind guides. <clears throat> you say, now blind guide, you know, one of our members at our safe harbor is Robert Jacobs, and he's blind. And he's done amazing things. He's created things. He has ideas. He's a sought after speaker. He's just incredible. But Robert would tell you that if you're going to go through the Rocky Mountain National Park, let's say that you're not going to want him to guide you on the hiking trails. Well, these people are blind guides theologically. They think they're guiding people, but they're blind. They don't know what they're talking about. So he says, you say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he's bound by his oath. What? Well, this doesn't make any sense of, at all to us. So let's make it make sense by putting it in its culture. What they were doing was finding ways to get out of oaths and finding legalistic ways of getting around responsibility. So they would say, yes, yes, I will pay you such and such, and, or I will help your child get a job or whatever. I swear by the temple. And then they didn't do it. They go, well, I didn't swear by the gold in the temple. What? Or I didn't swear by the altar. He goes on. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But if he swears by the gift on it, He's bound by his oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it, and he who swears by the temple swears by it and the one who dwells in it, and he who swears by heaven swears on God's throne and by the one who sits on it. In other words, stop it. As Jesus had said earlier, let your yes be yes and your no be no and mean it. In the book of Ecclesiastes, it says, don't be one of those that makes a, um, a, a rash vow and then doesn't, doesn't come up to it. And Proverbs talks a lot about that as well. Be a person that when you say something, you're not, trying to, you're not trying to leave a false impression or find a way around it. Now, if you try to leave a false impression, that's just another form of uh, dissimilitude or lying. Uh, for example... I'll use myself as illustration here. I came home from university and it was quite the drive. I left, I got in, uh, and I got in a bit earlier than they were expecting. And my father said, did you speed? And I said, I gotta admit, I went over the speed limit once. He just nodded. Well, what I didn't tell him was I went over speed limit about the time I left the, the driveway where I was and stayed over the speed limit until I got to them. So did I lie? Yeah, yeah, I did. I, I, if, I, if the impression you're trying to leave is different from reality, it's a lie. And the Pharisees were doing all, well, I didn't say that. You know, what I said was technically true. You know, all of that sort of thing. You know, little white lies versus all of that sort of thing. Um, 
and they were making this kind of doctrine. It's kind of kind of like people that will grab one verse in scripture and then try to remake all the scripture around it, or they'll already have an idea and then they'll go to the Bible to try to find proof for it, which is called scholasticism, happens all the time. Um, you have this casuistic ratiocination where you, you're just going all around and, and you're grabbing piecemeal off the buffet until you design a new dish and say, behold, no, no. We need to be straight with people. We need to be honest with ourselves and with each other. He goes, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrite. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, cumin, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. Now, in the crowd at this time, a lot of the Pharisees would have already left, but some of them would be standing there shouting back at Jesus. We don't get the interplay it's understood if you're a first, second, third century Jew, but it's not understood for us. We don't see it, but it, it, this would have been a very noisy group. And those people in the crowd that were not Pharisees would have been laughing at the Pharisees because Jesus is saying some things here that are very humorous in a Semitic way. For example, they're tithing dill. You ever seen dill seeds? and mint and cumin. So there are the, okay, you know, one for God and nine for me and one for God and one for him. They might have done it by weight instead of individual seed, but the point is still there. And then he says, but you've neglected the weightier matters of the law. Wait a minute. Are there some things that are weightier in God's mind than others? Or have we been told that all sins are the same to God, and therefore, you know, you know everything you, you... I think we have to be really careful not to put words in God's mouth here. We, um, we have a job to do. Matthew 25 will show us that. And J Jesus has shown us that through his life, and then tells us, follow me, do what I told you, teach others to do the things I told you to do. And that didn't have anything to do with go to church, dress up, sit there, get preached at, do all these things, and therefore you might go to heaven when you die. None of that is in Jesus' teaching. Not a word of it. And by the way, it's not really in Paul's teaching either or John's teaching either. It's added on later by control people, but not by God. The weightier matters are what? Protect people. Justice, mercy, faithfulness. And here's where the Pharisees will jump on. Oh, faithfulness. That means all the commandments that we've come up with that we think God is required. No. Faithfulness is a word which means faithful to God, but it also means faithful to each other. They can count on you. That you have, you're the one that they can count on. They can call you. They can email you. They if, a, if something happens, they know you care, and you, your care will be active. You won't just say, be ye warmed and filled, but you'll work to make sure they're warmed and filled. Be faithful to them. Be faithful to God by being faithful to them with mercy and justice. And they didn't do that. And then he says, and this is very important, don't stop doing the the tithing of the mint and the dill and the cumin. But do the weightier matters too. Sometimes when we read this, the impression given in a lesson is that all of those tithing things need to be just ignored. Just do this. No, there, there's still things that we need to do. And there are still, you know, tithing, you know, being exact. Okay, yeah, yeah. Now, a Christian is not uh, ordered to tithe in the New Testament. They're not. It seems that that was still being done, though, uh, by Jewish Christians and a lot of Gentile Christians picked it up. Paul gives the only real clarification here when he says, you know, God loves a cheerful giver, but don't give out of compulsion, but give as you have prospered. Uh, if you, right now, for example, you've got 
couple kids in college and you've, you've got bills and somebody's lost a job and you're wondering how in the world are you going to make the, the light stay on by paying the bill? You're not prospering right now. And we get that. And we're not going to guilt you into saying, well, you still need to tithe. There are churches that make you sign documents that you're going to tithe before you pay your bills. No, no. But let's be honest. We've prospered. I've got more clothes in my closet than I need. I've got some golf clubs that I don't need. I've got things that I've overbought. We have more towels than we probably need. You know what I mean? We can act like we're poor, but the fact is we've probably prospered fairly well. And since we've prospered, we are to, to give. Does that always mean to a church? No, no. Although our safe harbor would love to receive funds I, I got to be honest with you, the giving sometimes means giving to your neighbor next door or to the food bank down the street. It means giving in your neighborhood and loving the people around you. But while we do that, we also make sure that we try to follow the rest of what Jesus taught too. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, then the outside will also be clean. Well, um, I already told you about the lie about speeding. This let, Let's reveal another um, imperfect part of Patrick here. I'm real big on the washing of the cups and such. In fact, I wash the dishes in our home. Uh, we have a dishwasher, but some of the things don't go in the dishwasher. And so I wash those. Because it's just, it's a way I can contribute back to Cammy for all of her care and making the meal. I thoroughly wash. Somebody who's worked with science at the level that I have, we thoroughly wash those dishes. All right? But that's not what he's talking about. He's saying on the outside, you look so good. You look so faithful. You look so love. you know, just I am strictly following our Yahweh and all these things, but inside, inside there's greed and self-indulgence. I have always said, and I've said it out loud and I've said it in written form, that I'm a better Christian outside than inside. I am so glad that God has given me some ability to filter what is inside before it gets outside. And the filters don't always work, frankly but they, they work most of the time. And when I've said that to people before, I've had people respond with the opposite. They say, well, I'm a better Christian inside than I am outside. And I get that. What they mean is their intentions are good. You know, they have love and the like, but outside they blow it in the way that they, they behave or speak. Me, it's generally the other way. Generally, I'm nicer in speaking and in acting than I really am, you know, inside. You know, I'm behind a, a slow driver. Outside, I'm not beeping the horn. I'm not saying they're number one by gesturing outside. I'm not weaving back and forth. I'm not tailgating. Inside, I might be wanting them to die. Probably not die. Just not be there. And the same thing with other things. I, I will, on the outside, be very well behaved. On the inside, just... just and so I get that Jesus is talking to me here. He may be talking to you as well. We have to work on cleaning up our inside so that it matches our outside. So they're both clean. And by the way, those of you that are better Christians inside than outside have the opposite job to do, don't you? You have to find a way to make your outside as clean and well-meaning as your inside. But I think we all are hit by this one. I, I don't really think that a lot of us survive a trip through Matthew 23 unscathed. And this one, I've got to tell you, hits me hard. And I, I work on it literally every single day. I remind myself every single day. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, the same thing he's just talked about, 
which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. We've seen it, haven't we? We've been in churches where the leaders of the church sat there, whether male or female, whether official leaders or they really, that family has kind of run that church, whatever that is. And we know that they're unkind and we know that they've hurt us and we know they've driven others off to maintain their power. And we know all of that. And yet they sit there and do all of the out, outward and it has driven so many people away from the church and sadly so many people away from God. Don't be those people. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a lesson for all of us. Don't be those people. We don't need to judge those people. We, we, we see them. We just need to not be them. And it's a struggle, isn't it, to be clean outside like you're, you like, well, to be clean inside rather. So that when people looked at your outside, they saw cleanliness too. So again, you know, this is one of those arrows that we, we can shoot at other people, but a couple arrows might be coming back. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our forefathers, we would have not taken part with them and shed in the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourself that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the sin of your forefathers. Um, that last phrase makes no sense to us, but I'll explain it when I get to it, right? What's going on here? He's saying, you know, we, you know, the Pharisees are going around saying, we honor, to pick some, Ezekiel and Jeremiah. And had we been living in those days, we would have not let them put Jeremiah in a pit. We would not have, you know, mistreated Ezekiel. We would, we would have listened to Amos. We would have listened to Obadiah. And he's going, no, you, no, you wouldn't. Your fathers murdered them. You're the descendants of the murderers of the prophets. Now, that's pretty rough, but let's deal with some of this. We have people around us that we hear that will say, you know, those people in the 1700s were evil. They did slavery. There is not a culture on the planet that has not done slavery in some form. And it is still existent in this world. And the idea that if you'd lived in the 1700s, you would have been born with the 2024 mentality toward it is self-delusion. No, you wouldn't. Now, did some oppose it? You might have been fortunate and becoming one of those people. But this chronological arrogance that will let us judge George Washington, King George, let's judge all of these people by our standards in 2024 is ridiculous because the only reason you're judging them is because your culture taught you you can. Their culture taught them that. If you'd been born there, that would have been your culture. And you know, if I was a, a German in 1930, I would have stood against Hitler. A lot did, so that's certainly possible, but the majority did not. He won by massive majorities. Now, there was intimidation involved, but let's still, I, the research is very plain that he had the backing of the people, at least for the first bits. Um, you probably would have too. Please remember in America, it was a close run thing. We had, um, we had heroes in aviation and heroes in engineering and heroes in politics that wanted to take Hitler's side. It is, um, it is foolish for us to act like we would have been better than our forefathers. We wouldn't, there's just no way. And Jesus is saying that to them. He's saying, you decorate the tombs of the prophets. And you go, you go, if we'd been there, we would never, yes, you would have. And then he said, fill up then the measure of the sin of your forefathers. It's another way of saying, admit it, open it. Just say, open your mouth and just say, 
We're just like them. And we're going to kill the prophets too because they're about to kill Jesus. They're exactly like their fathers. But they would have gone, no, no, no. We're going to kill Jesus to protect our faith. Yeah, you can get that twisted. And they did. Not because they're Jews, but because they're people. And people can do that. He goes, you snakes. You brood of vipers. Do you understand what he just said? You snakes. Your mamas are snakes. So he said, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore, I'm sending you prophets and wise men and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Stop right there. We hear the word crucify a lot. Um, we hear it because we teach the story of Jesus and the crucifixion and all that other. Um, they did not hear that in their talking to each other. They knew about crucifixion. They saw it. It was horrific. It was a living nightmare until it became a dead nightmare, which generally took a few days. They, it was the most horrible thing you could say. And to look at them and say, you're going to take prophets and you're going to crucify them. There would have been a lot of noise in the crowd when Jesus said this. Some of them you'll kill and crucify. Others you'll flog in your synagogues. In other words, in church, you will beat them and lay their skin open. You'll pursue them from town to town. Remember what they did to Paul. A group of them even made an oath not to eat or drink until they killed him. So uh, upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. I tell you the truth, all of this will come down upon this generation. And here we're leading into what happens in chapter 24. The fall of Jerusalem in AD 70 was one of the most horrific events in history. It was an absolute tragedy. It destroyed Phariseeism, but it also took away the records of the tribes of Israel. And so a, a Jewish person today can't say, well, I'm a Levite, I'm a Benjamite. I'm a... They can't say that with any degree of confidence because the things were just wiped out. And Jesus is warning, it's going to come down on you. All that you have done and all you plan to do and all you will do to the prophets, Jesus is saying, I'll send to you. It's all going to come upon you in this generation. And it does within 30 some years of Jesus saying this. We close out the chapter this way. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who sent the prophets and stone those who sent to you. How often I've longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. Look. For your house is left in you, desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Referring there at Psalm 118. It's a sad thing. He says, I, I would have gathered you. I would have protected you. But you wouldn't let me. So it's coming. The destruction is coming. What is that destruction? What will that look like? That's next week. Thank you for being with us. Please share this. Let people hear the story. Let them see Jesus had sides to him that don't really show up in the Sunday school songs. And that makes him more valuable because he protects us. He gets in between us and the dangers and the hurt. And he takes care of us. He is strong as well as love. He's our priest. And that means something. It really does. Go in peace, church. Talk to you soon. Cheers.